Hi, this is Ash with Spark 59. By now you should have taken your business model as far as you can or should on paper. Yes, I know you can probably continue brainstorming possibilities, but endlessly brainstorming possibilities grounded in uncertainty is a recipe for failure. It's time to get outside the building and gather empirical evidence from people other than yourself. This brings us to the second meta principle. Your next goal should be identifying what's riskiest on your canvas because testing the entire business model at once can be overwhelming. Plus, it will take too long. As we'll see shortly, not everything needs to be tested at the same time. It's more effective to incrementally test your business model and incorporate your learning along the way. This meta principle of tackling the riskiest parts first follows from the business model as a product theme I shared earlier. Given a hard deadline for a project, you wouldn't start by building what's easiest but what's hardest or riskiest to avoid any last minute thrashing. The same applies to your business model. I would go even further and say that building a successful product is fundamentally about risk mitigation. The true job of an entrepreneur is systematically de-risking their business model over time. I'm often approached by solo founders looking to find other co-founders. The technical founders tell me they are building a product and need a business-oriented co-founder. The business-oriented co-founders tell me that they have this killer idea but can't find a technical co-founder to build it with. My answer to both of them is the same. Until you gather some additional evidence that your idea has legs, it's too risky for others to jump in on faith alone. They can't see what you see and it's your job as the entrepreneur to convince them that this is a project worth committing to. The same applies with customers. Customers are constantly bombarded with product offers. Good marketing is essentially about connecting with your customers' needs and de-risking the offer so that they pick you versus the alternative. The first thing that gets their attention is your unique value proposition or the promise you make. Raising investment too isn't done solely on the merits of your solution, but rather by de-risking all these things, traction being the one that gets the most attention. So with all that, let's turn back to the canvas and see how you prioritize these kinds of risks. The first thing to realize is that your canvas has lots of uncertainty. When you first start out, almost everything is uncertain, but there's a difference between uncertainty and risk. So it helps to start with some definitions. An uncertainty is simply the existence of multiple possible outcomes. For instance, you may not know whether customer segment A is a better early adopter than customer segment B. But a risk is a quantified state of uncertainty where we attribute a value to being wrong. So in the previous example, customer segment A may represent a higher price point than customer segment B. If your business model hinges on being able to charge your customers that higher price point, missing that mark could have a catastrophic effect, and so it would be a higher risk. Next, let's talk about the different types of risks. The first is product risk, which is all about getting the product right. On the canvas, product risk is represented by the problem, solution, and unique value proposition boxes. I also include cost structure because it represents the resources you need to build out your product and revenue streams because pricing is very much part of your product too, as you might remember from earlier where I showed you the bottled water example. Customer risk is all about building a scalable path to customers. On the canvas, it is represented by the customer segment, early adopters, and channel boxes. And finally, market risk is all about building a viable business, which on the canvas are represented by these boxes. Existing alternatives because they represent your true competition, the key metrics you will use to measure traction, the intersection between your cost structure and revenue streams will determine your margins or viability of the business model. And finally, your unfair advantage story to defend against competition. So the good news is that while everything on your canvas is uncertain to some degree, not all uncertainties are equal from a risk perspective. The first step to prioritizing risk is understanding the three stages of a product. What's riskiest on your canvas morphs as you move through each of these stages, so let's walk through them. The first stage is the problem solution fit stage. Here you ask yourself whether you have a problem worth solving in the first place. From a risk perspective, the biggest risks initially lie in the customer segment and problem boxes. If you don't understand customers and their problems, you can't build the right solution for them. 
and everything else on the canvas falls apart. This is why I push entrepreneurs to start with this quadrant in their initial testing. Once you have a good enough problem and customer segment understanding, you can then start formulating the first version of your solution or what in the lean sense we'd call a minimum viable product. You are then ready to move into the second stage where the key question is testing whether you have built something enough people want. From a risk perspective at this stage, aspects of your product like your solution, unique value proposition, and pricing are probably most important. It's also important to point out that this stage is more about learning versus optimization. And pricing is a good way to illustrate this distinction. I consider revenue streams as one of the riskier aspects of your product. If you find out later that customers won't pay for your product, that can be fatal for your business model. That's why I advocate charging for your product from day one versus hiding behind an alpha or beta product excuse. That said, at this stage, I'm also more interested in testing that people will actually pay something than trying to find out that optimal price. Testing that people will pay is a learning goal. Finding the optimal price is an optimization goal better saved until the next stage. Now, once you have enough people using your product, your focus then shifts to the final stage where your goal is to scale your product. At this stage, you have demonstrated that your product does deliver value at least at small scale. Your risks now shift towards scaling your solution, scaling your channels, optimizing margins, and establishing your competitive advantage against copycats and competition. Understanding these three stages of the startup and the underlying learning milestones is very helpful in triaging your risks. The problem we have as entrepreneurs isn't necessarily identifying things to work on, but focusing on the right things to work on at the right time. Incorrect prioritization of risks is one of the top contributors of waste. Here I'll show you a quick brainstorming exercise to do with your team for triaging your risks in this way. You hand out post-it notes to everyone on your team and have them write out their top 10 risks. You then triage these risks first by when they matter. That is, when will the particular risk have the greatest impact? You roughly group them by the three stages, problem solution fit, product market fit, or scale. Next, you place them into one of the quadrants on the right, based first on how uncertain you are about the risk, and then based on the potential impact or value of the risk coming true. So using the pricing example again, I may be reasonably certain that customers will pay something for my product because there is evidence that they use other paid alternatives for solving this problem. But because my business model works only at a certain premium price point, that constitutes high risk. Once you've done the first one, similarly go back and triage all your other risks. A final step is quickly jotting down your mitigation plan under the risk or on a second post-it card. This is usually a one line or one sentence summary on how you might solve or address a particular risk. So for instance, if one of the risks is that nobody will buy from us because they don't yet trust us, one of the mitigation plans might be to go and get some third party social proof or third party certification or validation that we are indeed trustworthy. This is a good exercise to triage your known risks, but what about the risks you don't yet know that you don't know? The best way to uncover these kinds of risks is by having conversations with other people, people you would consider bringing on as advisors. These are typically other entrepreneurs with prior domain knowledge and or experience who can complement certain gaps on your own canvas. For instance, if you're trying to sell into the enterprise, talking to someone who has successfully done this before might help uncover certain tactics or risk areas that you might be able to avoid or employ to get into those markets. When setting up these meetings, I don't recommend simply emailing them a copy of your canvas and then asking them what they think. The reason is that the canvas is like a good slide deck. A slide deck often assumes context that needs to be communicated in person. And so if you just simply email them your canvas, you may be subject to a lot of misunderstanding. I instead recommend setting up a face-to-face -face meeting, if possible, or one over the phone with a potential advisor using a learning context. You aren't pitching, but seeking advice. Spend two to three minutes walking them through your canvas, ask them what they think, then shut up and listen. Pay particular attention to the immediate objections they raise. 
try not to view the objection as a reflection on yourself or try to convince them otherwise. Instead, view these objections as third-party external prioritization of risks that you most likely will need to address at some point. You should ask them what they think you would need to do to overcome these objections. After the meeting, similarly triage their risks to identify when they are important, how important they are, and what actions might be needed to mitigate them. While potential advisors are a great source for prioritizing risks, beware of the advisor paradox. At the end of the day, it is still your job to own your business model. No one can tell you what you do, and even though advisors usually have the best intentions at heart, they can give you bad advice. So instead of blindly following what advisors tell you, synthesize it and apply it. If they raise objections, try to find ways to address them. If they give you prescriptive advice, test it first at small scale. The process for finding good advisors is very similar to that of finding good early adopters. It takes time. When you do find a good advisor, consider turning it into a more formal relationship. So that's what I have to share on risks for today. Remember that incorrect prioritization of risk is the top contributor of waste, so don't skimp out on this step. It can also make the difference between accelerating your learning and simply spinning your wheels with needless busy work. Next time, I'll talk about how you set up, design, and run experiments to mitigate your top risks. Until then, take care.